Stanford University. Hello, um, <clears throat> welcome to uh, CS547 uh, here at Stanford University. Uh, I'm Andreas Pepke, standing in for, for Terry Winograd, who is out of town. Uh, we'll have some great uh, uh, speakers today, and I'll introduce them shortly, but uh, this is the first seminar of the quarter, and so uh, we'll have to go through a couple of logistics for those of you who are signed up for the seminar as a class. And uh, Ranjita Kumar will go through those logistics, and then I will introduce the speakers shortly. OK, so if you're taking this uh, seminar for a unit, uh, you're required to watch all of the lectures. If you cannot attend class, um, you're and you're an, or you're an SCPD student, uh, you have to watch the videos online. But if you are a non-SCPD student, you are required to attend seven out of the nine lectures in person. So during class, there will be an attendance sheet that's going around. So make sure your uh, signature gets on it. This is the current list I got from AXIS today. So if you're not registered yet, just put your name on the back and sign. So um, make sure you sign this every class. Uh, for if for some reason you miss it, send an email as quickly as possible. I'm not the TA for this class uh, this quarter. So if you go to the website, um, you can click on the administrative details to see more about all of the the good stuff you need to know for the class. Um, so. Jesse is the actual TA, so you will want to send the emails to Jesse, and his email is on the website. So please make sure you check uh, and read all of the administrative details. Um, and also, if you have a specific class conflict, make sure you email Terry Winograd uh, as soon as you can to get permission to watch all the videos online. So that should be all the important stuff you need to know. So today's speakers come from the Mozilla Foundation, which is uh, maybe best known for its Firefox browser and various um, earlier versions. Firefox has grown into a, a, a really a gigantic enterprise, and I'm told about a quarter of a billion people are, are using it. Uh, so. Uh, it is really one of the, the, the largest circulation uh, projects and therefore uh, poses significant problems in the design, uh, especially since many of the contributors are outside developers that are not formally part of the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, and so it's a unique organization, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Uh, Mike Beltzner and John Lilly are, uh, one is the CEO, the other one is the director. I think they'll figure it out uh, for you if, if, if that's required. And um, <coughs> one is uh, uh, stationed up in Toronto, and you will recognize him as soon as he says out. And uh, the other one is stationed down here in the valley. So please welcome one of them. Okay, you're already wired. I'm wired. Hi, thanks for coming. So um, I have to decide whether I want to sit or stand. I think I'll probably prowl around. And I'll, um, I'm going to wring my arm, my hands a little bit. Cause it's, it's a funny thing to say, but it's a little bit intimidating and sort of um, humbling to be here. Because uh, I'm an alum. Uh, uh, you know, I took classes from uh, Professor Planck, who's in the audience now. It's nice to see him again. Terry Winograd was my advisor about 15 years ago. And so um, it's nice to come back uh, 
it's a little freaky because the pads are still the same and the pens are still the same. Um, so this kind of give me a flashback. So if you guys all, <clears throat> I'm a bit of a fast talker. So if I talk too quickly, um, somebody throws something at me. Uh, Mike talks fast too. Um, but if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I'll tell a little bit of personal history and how I got to be where I am, and, and, and it's really relevant to this particular class. We'll talk a little bit about Mozilla and the background about why, why you care much. We'll talk, Mike will talk a lot about how we do design at Mozilla, because I think it's quite distinct from anywhere else in the world. We'll talk a little bit about what we're thinking about next, and then we'll, we'll do some questions. So, 15 years ago this year, and I think in 1993, <clears throat> This guy came and gave a demo. Now, this guy, <clears throat> and he brought one of these. And it wasn't quite in this room. It was, but it was one of these Friday seminars. It was at lunchtime. It was in, it was in Terman, is where, where it was. But he, <clears throat> he had one of these down on his desk, a Next, if you guys, you guys may be all too young to recognize that, sorry. Um, and he demoed this. And this is an amazing thing. So um, this is the first web browser. And it's the first web. You can see that uh, the title, this is the Next UI. But the title at the very top says World Wide Web. And it goes to links, and you can link to Mart. And these are the first web pages. And so he gave us a demo. And I remember, I remember explicitly thinking to myself, wow, that's kind of cool. Pictures, text, click, click, click. Uh, and then I fell asleep. <laughs> I, really, I really did fall asleep. I remember waking up at the end of the class. Is and so, good news on the day? <laughs> well, it is what it is. I mean, like, I was a student, and I was tired, and maybe, maybe hungover. But, yeah, but it, it, so I find it ironic now that I'm involved with Mozilla, and we, we, about 20% of the world's uh, internet users use our browser to, <coughs> to surf, and so I, I find it, <clears throat> you know, some irony that, that I kind of missed it the first time they showed it to me in 1992, 1993. But then things got a lot better. Um, I started taking a class, like I said, from, from Winograd and Verplank, um, and then a guy who's become a great friend of mine, a guy named Mitch Kapor, who founded Lotus and the EFF, he wrote an essay called The Software Design Manifesto. And <clears throat> in this essay, he argued that a new profession needed to get created, and it was software designer. And he wasn't talking about software engineer. He wasn't talking about software architect. He was talking about someone who thinks kind of fundamentally about the design of software. And this, this essay changed my life. Um, so I want to read the beginning, because it's, really, uh, it's really worth reading. And the words are still modern, especially to me, because of what we do. So what he said is the great and rapid success of the personal computer industry over the past decade is now without its unexpected ironies. What began as a revolution of individual empowerment has ended with the personal computer industry not only joining the computing mainstream, but in fact defining it. And so he was positing that this thing that, that he thought was quite old at that time, 20 years, this revolution, had resulted not in, in personal empowerment, but <clears throat> in really just becoming the mainstream. And for me, like, these words could in many ways define Mozilla and what we do now around impersonal empowerment and revolution against like, accepting what software is given to you, whether it's from Apple or Google or Microsoft. So, you know, like I said, I work with Mitch on any number of things now, but these words changed my life. So once I got my master's uh, here at Stanford in HCI, it was 95 when I finished. I went to a software company. It was called Trilogy, and we did enterprise software. And it was, it was funny, because uh, you know, I had my newly minted HCI degree, and nobody really knew what that meant. And so I got, I got to Trilogy, and, the, and one of the VPs came by and said, OK, we need you to draw some icons. I'm like, yeah, I don't really draw. And they said, OK, well, uh, we need you to sex up this demo. I'm like, yeah, I don't really do that either. They said, well, can you code? I'm like, well, I, I can code, but I don't think that's what I'm best at. And, and I, they, I remember this, this guy's like, well, what the hell are you good at? Like, why, why are you here? And that was the state of software design in 1995. But we made some progress, and Trilogy Software got better, and we hired a bunch of designers and published into Kai. And, and then I went to Apple and ATG Labs, where we were trying to figure out how to create innovation that started to infect the rest of the organization, how to change Apple. And Apple's labs history is a strange thing, having to do with Steve and personalities, but I left there eventually. <clears throat> and then I went to a company called Reactivity, or I started a company called Reactivity, and that was an incubator. And the idea we had there is we wanted to hire as many smart founders as we could and let them start things. And so what you'll notice is that I was trying to figure out how to get increasing degrees of innovation to the edges of every organization I was at. I was trying to figure out how to get people 
uh, not necessarily associated with entrepreneurship or design or innovation at the edges doing more stuff. And so the questions that I started to ask, they changed from how do I design this great thing to how do organizations do design? How do organizations design great things? And so that eventually, I think, and I think naturally, led me to Mozilla, where you go from a software company to a labs to a, an incubator. You're moving out to the edges and finally to an ecosystem where you've got innovation everywhere and actually not even really mostly inside the organization. It's, it's spread out for, through, throughout. So that's how I got here. And I got to Mozilla about four years ago and became the CEO about a year ago. Um, but I'm a designer at heart. Um, but I'm more interested now in how you design organizations to design than doing the actual bits and the, and the, and the interaction designs too. Although Mike, who does much of the interaction design, uh, I complain to him a lot about our design. So he'll have some things to say. So this is all we do. So Mozilla, we're in, we belong to a nonprofit, and our whole mission is to make the inter inter internet better. That's it, full stop. Um, I think more, more specifically than that, we want people to engage and participate. We want people, we want to help people around the world lean in and work to make the internet better. Because participation, like the manifesto that Mitch wrote, like this is a revolution and it's people and individuals and individual expression and that's, that's the key thing. So <clears throat> beyond, beyond the mission, uh, we're a global open source project. We have people all around the world. Thousands of people write code. And Mike will tell you about how this works because it, um, you know, one of my friends, uh, Professor Bob Sutton, is, is fond of saying that Mozilla is amazing and that it really, really shouldn't exist at all. It's kind of surprising that it works at all. Um, it's about a quarter billion users now. So we, we're, we're somewhere between 250 million and 300 million people use Firefox um, in any given day. It, it turns out it's hard to count uh, when you get that high. And it's hard to tell numbers for sure. Um, and we make Firefox. So Firefox, and how many people use Firefox as their main web browser? That's pretty good. Uh, what else do people use? How many people use IE? N not a single. <laughs> <laughs> and how many people use Chrome? A couple. And how many people use Safari? A few more. And Opera? <coughs> Just one. All right. Two. Well, they'll be happy with that. Okay, so, um, so Firefox, about 40% is written by people who are not on Mozilla's payroll. And that that's true now with Firefox 3 and Firefox 3.5 that's coming, but it was also true when we launched Firefox 1.0 four years ago. We only had about 10 employees then, and about 40% was written by other people. Um, we have about 225 employees now in about 20 countries around the world, and still about 40, uh, 40, 42% is written by other people. Um, the, I think as the projects get bigger, the, the, the surface area for um, openness and, and playing around moves out. And Firefox has something called add-ons where people do experiment to change the way the browsers behave. And there's about 8,000 of those <coughs> written by our community all around the world. And we ship in about 60 languages, which is kind of a, it's a, it's not, it, you know, it's kind of, it sounds like a factoid. But we were hoping to ship in 70 for Firefox 3.5. But it's worth noting that Microsoft, when they shipped IE 7, they shipped in English. And then a few weeks later, they shipped in German and Japanese and French. And so this little company, Mozilla, this 200 people, we shipped 60 languages day of release. And, it's be it's because, and we did one of them. And 59 of them were done by the communities all around the world. Because we, were we gave them tools so they could do their own work and make their own lives different. So I'm, I'm proud of the, that, that one statistic and maybe, maybe anything else about Mozilla. This is a, uh, a year ago's market share slide. Um, it just kind of gives you a sense of where we are around the world. A at this point, we're about 22% of the world uses Firefox. Um, it's higher in Europe. We just went over 50% in Poland uh, yesterday, day before. Um, we're at 50% 50 or more web browser in about 12 countries now. Um, and things are looking OK. So, Mike's going to talk about how we do design, and I want to put some models into your head for a minute. Um, I think most people, when you say, who, does, who, who are the best designers in the industry, most people will say, well, Steve or Jonathan Ivey, uh, Johnny Ives at, um, at Apple. And, and they're very good. Like, I, I, have more, I, mean, I have more Apple stuff than I really like to admit in my house. And I, I use it, and I love it, and I have an iPhone, and all this other stuff. Um, but I think Apple's model is genius-driven. So... You know, 
and, and I worked there, so I, I know a little bit about this, but, you know, people would work on an interface, and they'd go present to the geniuses. And they'd say, well, what do you think? Here's nine choices. <clears throat> and, you know, the answer would be, well, this is good, this is not so good, I'd like this one, but with a little more of that. And so you'd iterate, and you'd iterate, and eventually, they'd say, okay, that's good enough to ship. And you get an iPhone, or you get a, or you get a, or you get a Mac. And I think that's a, that's a re it turns out each of these models has strengths and weaknesses. Um, I think the strength of this is that you often get, routinely get, museum quality pieces as long as your geniuses are genius enough and as long as they're around. Um, but I think it has real limitations that it doesn't empower lots and lots of people and lots of robust innovation across the network. Google's different, and I, I should, I, I say it in the title, but these are, these are oversimplifications. These are models and caricatures. It's not exactly like this. Like, there are many, many more good designers at Apple than the press thinks there are. There are many, many more good designers at Apple than, than, uh, than just Johnny and Steve. <clears throat> but Google, uh, you know, there was just a blog post about a designer who left Google to go to Twitter because he was tired of, of uh, he wanted to do a certain color scheme for a product. And uh, they said, well, let's test it out. And they tested out 41 shades of blue. And they just, they just put it out on the web. They let their millions of users do it, and then they did the analysis on which one worked best. And so Google, I think, exemplifies the, the, the trend in Silicon Valley, which is data-driven design. And I, I fell in love with data-driven design for a while, too, because when I, when I came through Stanford, when I got my, my HCI degree, it was very, very design-oriented, very prototype-oriented. You'd go do paper prototypes, you'd get field tests, you'd get anecdotal evidence, and you'd try to, you'd try to design the right thing and get, the, and, and get as good coverage of... of uh, reactions and feedback as you could. But um, the, the gestalt in Silicon Valley now is like, well, you've got all this stuff. You can, you can build something and put it on the web, and then you can instrument it and see how people actually use it, and then make your design decisions based on the data that comes back. And <clears throat> that's a very, very important skill. It's hap it, it's, it, it gives you better answers in a lot of cases than almost any other things. But there are limitations to data-driven design, too, in that they'll tend to get you to local maxima local best spots. They'll tend to say, how do I make this thing I've got a little bit better, and a little bit better, and a little bit better, but if you're on this hill, you can get to the top of this hill, but it can't help you figure out if you should be on this other hill completely, or in this other place completely. And so <clears throat> I think data-driven design is an important skill to have, an important tool, and, I, and I'm hopeful that, uh, well, in some of the things that I'm working on in D-School, for example, I'm, I'm trying to help people get ex exposure to how to do data-driven design more and more. And again, at Google, there are many, many extremely good designers. I'm, I'm kind of painting them as a caricature. <clears throat> but there, so there are strengths and limitations of data-driven design. At Mozilla, we do what's called chaotic design. And again, to caricature, there are many very good individual, talented designers at Mozilla. A chaotic is a, is a term coined by D. Hawk, who founded Visa in the, in the he coined it in the mid-90s. And it's part chaos and part order. And a chaotic system looks like that. That's, that turns out to be a map of the internet, you know, a while ago. It used to be that, that big, and now it's much bigger. Um, but chaotic systems, they exhibit some characteristics of chaotic systems and some characteristics of ordered systems. And the thing that happens is you tend to get nodal authority. So you tend to get people or individuals or groups that make their own design decisions in a pretty distributed way. And they tend to be pushed out to the edges of the organization or, or, or beyond it. And so the internet is like this, Wikipedia is like this, Mozilla is like this. Um, it tends to create systems that are very, very strong and robust. And it t tends to produce lots of innovation that's very unpredictable. Um, and so the key with chaotic systems needs to be about enabling lots of these things to happen and then trying to figure out what the hell is going on as it happens and trying to note the really good work and elevate it in a way. The limitations of chaotic systems are, like political systems, it's very hard to drive to a place you want to get to. It's very good at getting to a place where you maybe didn't expect it's a good place, but if you want to get from here to there, like a chaotic driving plan is a really bad idea. So anyway, so this is a little bit how we think about design, and I think Mike will give you some, put some meat on the bones about how we really think about this. So Mike, Mike uh, has been a designer for Firefox for a long time, and he's one of my favorite people at Mozilla to interact with. Um, he will talk with a bit of a, a, bit of a northern accent, so <laughs> good, good luck. And hopefully this thing's on and you can hear me. So um, as people have alluded to, you're going to find out pretty quickly that I'm not from around here. Uh, I come from the snowy shores of Canada. Uh, I went to school here. This is 1998. It doesn't always look like that. Um, 
I, I kind of tripped into doing design work. I studied cognitive psychology, which at my alma mater is literally computers and psychology, and they just shove it together and hope it works. It tends to be more about artificial intelligence than it does to be about human-computer interaction. Um, but luckily, uh, I found this book uh, when I was auditing a graduate level course, which I eventually had to drop because they wanted me to pay for it but not get credit for it. Um, and I found out that I really liked the inverse of artificial intelligence. So instead of trying to figure out how to make computers think like people, I, I really wanted to figure out how we can make computers understand people more and how we could make them present themselves more as people and as people would want themselves to be presented. So uh, I did this. Uh, I also studied education. I was going to become a high school teacher. Uh, I didn't like the union, so I went to IBM because they don't like unions either. Uh, and uh, at IBM, I started doing software design. Uh, there's a book written by a guy who works at IBM called The User-Centered Design Process. If you were taking an HCI course in early 2000, you would have probably read this book. Uh, it was the corporate process for design. It was a data-driven, uh, very robust software development model for human-computer interaction. It was actually a very good foundation. Uh, but then IBM embraced this thing called Eclipse, which was an open source project. It's a development tool. How many people here have used Eclipse? Oh, awesome. Cool. Sorry. Um, I, I worked on the design of the first Java development tools for Eclipse. Uh, young kid left behind the ears. But what it did was it got me involved in open source. And I started paying more attention to things like Mozilla. And I made a friend at, uh, at Mozilla. And then in 2005, uh, I started with Mozilla. And I got there in time to work on Firefox 1.5. And I was hired to be uh, originally a software designer. Um, around Firefox 2, I, I started becoming the Mozilla design lead. So all of a sudden, I started getting involved with more of the user experience of Firefox. So not just the web browser, but also the web page when you downloaded it how you went about finding it, what our web pages looked like, uh, what an update looked like, how that experience went through. Firefox 3, uh, I started doing a bit more product design, how we presented to the market. We started, uh, I called myself a phenomenologist at the time, which is a fancy way of saying whole user experience. And I've, I've started to, to now do sort of product direction, which means that uh, I'm failing up. People are recognizing that I'm not a great actual interaction designer, but uh, I'm pretty decent at talking about it and figuring out how we can make it happen. And a challenge that I like to give myself and a lot of other people is to think about open source design and to think about what it means to you and, and how that makes you react. And generally, uh, what I find is that people react three ways. Um, they say, well, it's going to be designed by committee, like a camel, right? A horse that needs to carry water. Um, it's like lipstick on the pig or not ready for prime time. Those are, if you search the web, it turns out that those things come up a lot when you talk about design and open source. And they're not wrong um, because, as, as John mentioned, it's really chaotic. Uh, and the real sort of skill and, and power that can come out of open source design is by actually trying to figure out how to make sense and order out of this chaos. These comments, if you read them, by the way, are all actual comments from users. And you'll notice they're contradictory and insightful and obvious and useful and not useful all at the same time. Um, and the real goal of doing open source design is trying to figure out how to take all of that and then make it a bit more ordered so that you can actually do something with it. Um, so how do you do that? It's a good question. Uh, three guidelines that I've generally come up with is you need to be able to listen, you need to be able to lead, and then you also need to be able to play with your community. Uh, and so let me tell you a little bit more about what I mean about these things, um, and a little bit more about chaos. So as John said, I was going to talk a bit about how we actually develop software. This, uh, these are screenshots uh, from Bugzilla. And it's, it's kind of an interesting um, system that we have. Bugzilla, which is literally a database of things that are labeled as bugs or problems or defects in our software, is the central tracking and uh, coordination mechanism for all of our software development. So if you want a new feature in Firefox, you consider it a bug that that feature does not instantly exist. And you write down, Firefox doesn't do this thing, and we accept or reject the fact that it's a bug, but you start talking about it. And the very fact that you're, you're talking about it in a bug tracking database, where people are commenting and replying to each other's comments, um, if anybody here has ever experienced YouTube comments or Slashdot comments or any sort of online bulletin board system, a, a weird thing happens when you start to talk to people through these mechanisms, which is it's instantly about seeing who can be smartest quickest. Um, and who can make the most astute point, who can turn somebody's words around. You get a lot of just by nature conflicting, arguing comments. And this, this bug, I think, got to, what, 725 comments. 
uh, basically back and forth, should we do this, shouldn't we do this, how should we do this? So you, you get a lot of chaos there. A lot of chaos also comes from the very nature that anybody can submit a change or comment on the quality of the actual code itself. This is very different from pretty much every software organization out there. Uh, if you disagree with the way that we present a web page, you can actually submit a patch. You can change the code to have us present it in a different way. You could have it so that the word Stanford always appears in bold letters, for example. Uh, and, and that's something that you can write and contribute and put on a bug and get considered for inclusion in a product. Um, as I mentioned, you can also comment on the code. And the really interesting thing here is that when it comes to design, it's often a lot easier to comment on someone's design than it is to comment on someone's code. Um, these images reflect the two most common comments that we get on our design in Firefox. Uh, the, the one on the left is, my mom could never use this. And the one on the right is Fitz Law. Um, it turns out everybody knows about Fitz Law. We can pat ourselves on the back for doing a great job teaching everybody in the world about Fitz Law. We haven't taught them how to use it appropriately. Um, we, we make a mobile browser called Fennec, a little gesture-based thing. John's going to show a screenshot and talk about it a bit, I think. Uh, and somebody commented that we should put the buttons for our mobile browser in the upper corner so that they can take advantage of, of Fitz Law when you try to push them. And we had to mention that that would only work if we also shipped the browser with a piece of wood around it to stop your finger from traveling past it. But um, it, it turns out that because of the nature of design, people have stronger opinions and a willingness to actually comment on them. So you get camps formed very, very quickly. Uh, and a great example of this was around Firefox 2. We had a decision to make around where we'd put the close button for a tab. And up until that point, the close button for tabs had always been all the way to the right of your tab strip. There was one little X there, and you could keep on hammering away on it, and it would just close your tabs in sequence. And a lot of people were concerned that that was a little confusing, that the close button wasn't actually attached to the object, it wasn't good system design. So they proposed putting the close button on the tab. And then a lot of people said, that destroys my use case, or I now will accidentally click the close button when I click on the tab. And we had literally a 50-50 split when we took a look at the comments and when we took a look at, you know, we did polls and votes and all sorts of different things. And it was unclear what was going to happen. And the two camps would just entrench and the bug went on and on and on. And the result of a lot of this chaotic design is you get interfaces like this, um, which is getting slightly better in Firefox now, but I think still ships somewhat like that. And you can see how all the chaos has created this noisy, sort of unfocused design. I think there's four or five different system messages on here. Uh, there's some weird terminology that this add-on is unsigned, whatever that means. Uh, not only can it damage your computer or violate your privacy, you should only install it from sources you trust. There's a lot here for a user to understand when generally what they really want to do is install it and know if it's okay. So when I joined Mozilla in 2005, I noticed there was all this chaos and I was trying to figure out how does anything get done here? Um, but it turns out there's a lot of order as well. Not anyone can actually approve a change. Not all of the things in our bug tracking database will actually ever get done. There are places for people to discuss them, for people to talk about the advantages and disadvantages, the pros and cons, but that doesn't mean that they are actually things which will happen in the product. We just want people to be able to talk about them. Uh, it turns out there's a strong leadership structure uh, within the open source database. Uh, sorry, open source ecosystem. Uh, in, in Firefox, it comes in the form of this guy named Mike Connor. He sort of looks like that. Um, and he's, the, he's what's called the module owner for Firefox. And it turns out that, as John said, people will, will talk about these things at the edges. And if they can't reach agreement, if, if their nodal area of responsibility is, is just contention and can't be resolved, it rolls up. And it's up to Mike Connor to decide which way it's going to be. So we sort of combine some of that um, at the edge thing with a strong leadership structure to make sure that forward progress exists. It turns out there's a lot of education that can be done. So we can tell people what Fitz Law actually means, where it applies, and why, generally speaking, in our interface, people should be more concerned with Hicks Law than Fitz Law. We should be talking about all the choices we're asking users to make with various options and interface mechanisms, and not necessarily about how many pixels bigger we should make a button in order to make it a good target to hit. Uh, it turns out that there's a strong credit mechanism. I, this is a, an uneven question whenever I ask it. Have you guys read this book by Cory Doctorow called Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom? Anyone? Yeah, it's, it's, 
it's too old a book. Uh, it's available free. You can search the internet for it. Um, he talks about this. He, he postulates in the future, you know, we have free energy and a cure for death. So in that sort of society, money is meaningless. So what is the currency of society? And it turns out the currency is credit. It's social credit. It's the respect that you get for your ideas. And that actually gets qualified as this thing called woofy. And we actually use something much like woofy in the Mozilla community. Smart people who've made smart decisions that have done well for us in the past get listened to more. And you can see this in basically any community that you're involved in, if you, if you look for it. The people who are active and respected and who are making good ideas on behalf of the community or, or making good decisions on behalf of the community get listened to more. And it's up to those people to find other people within their community who have the capability to make smart decisions and come up with good ideas and elevate them to sort of contribute some of their social capital and social credit to them. And, and this is the way that this system tends to work. And so, again, within the Mozilla community, what you'll see is when people come up with smart design ideas, people are more likely to listen to them the next time they come up with an idea. And so, really, the, the other way of looking at it is, if you're a smart person who knows what you're doing, you're going to get people to follow you and to try to do the things that you're trying to do. And, and these, these ordered systems allow us to have actually a really interesting effect on design in that we get systems that are really well coordinated and they're parallel and they're leveraged. And what I mean by that is for this little thing which we did in Firefox 2, it's an old slide, but um, we added suggestions in the search bar. And what happened was somebody worked on how the design was going to be and you can imagine exactly how long it took us to come up with the fact that we just write suggestions in the upper right corner. That was about a month of going back and forth on different designs. There was a group that actually figured out what the implementation was going to be look, was going to look like in terms of getting the server data back from the, from the various search providers. And then there was a group who was actually talk, talking with the search providers to make sure that they would feed us that data. And we could do all these things sort of in parallel, and it all came together, and it was one of the better features that we were able to release in Firefox 2. And it, it makes a huge difference for users. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we lead. So how we build systems that allow us to actually lead people to the right sort of designs while not completely controlling them or, or stamping on them. So the, the first thing that we do at Mozilla is we try to provide uh, an organization and structure by which people can direct their contributions. Because the last thing you want is somebody who's got a really good idea sort of off screaming into the wind and not getting listened to. And so we try to be really, really public and really, really upfront with what our intentions are for a release, for a milestone, for the design of a feature. We do all of our planning in the public. We do all of our planning uh, in the same places. We have weekly meetings on Tuesdays and Wednesdays where we talk about what's going on in the development, what's going on with the next version. Um, based on these plans, we form small teams with actual declared leaders. The leader isn't necessarily the person who's going to do all the work, but the person who's responsible for making sure that the team is driving forward and doing something. Sometimes these people work for the Mozilla Corporation, sometimes they don't. Uh, but we make sure that Anybody who wants to get involved in working on that part of the product knows where to go and knows who to talk to. Um, we try to support those development teams. So when those development teams identify a potential problem, identify an area for research, then we try to create, we try to use our resources in order to help them get that data. So going back to that new tab discussion that I talked about, when we realized that those two camps were so deeply entrenched, this was a good place to get data. This was a good place to figure out which of those areas was the local maxima. And so we went and talked to some uh, rocket scientists uh, at NASA who happened to be nearby. Uh, and they did some great work actually with eye tracking and doing cognitive modeling to tell us exactly how big a tab would have to be before you could be sure that you're not going to click the X button by accident. The eye tracking really revealed that yes, the close button should be on the tab. And we were able to make what otherwise would have been a contentious change with a fair degree of certainty that it was the right thing to do. Um, the other thing that we do when we lead is, uh, and this is different than most open source projects, is that we, we treat disagreements like negotiations. Right back to the source with Firefox 1, there was a policy which basically read, just because you can doesn't mean we'll let you. Until then, in open source projects, what would have happened is if you disagreed with the design direction, it would have become an option. There would have been some option and some preference pane buried three or four levels deep that would have said, put the close buttons all the way back on the right. And that would have been the easiest way to get past the disagreement. Firefox explicitly does not do this. What we say is the, the alternative 
is that we just walk away. And there's this thing in negotiation theory, which everybody should take, because it's a fantastic theory uh, class to take, and I, I think Stanford offers courses on that. Um, it's called the BATNA, your best uh, alternative to a negotiated agreement. And the best alternative to a negotiated agreement in a lot of these cases is you get a couple of people very angry at you, and you build a better product. Um, that said, it's important to let people play and to let people have an opportunity to experiment and to have their close button anywhere they want in the product. And so what, what we try to do at Mozilla is make sure that we give contributors and our community complete freedom to play and explore with the interface. And we do this through a couple of mechanisms. The first is add-ons. As John mentioned, there's over 8,000 Firefox add-ons. And we actually see that as a playground for contributors to do really interesting things with our interface. Um, there are add-ons that optimize Firefox for shopping on eBay. There are add-ons that take all the flash out of Flickr. Uh, there are add-ons, uh, one of my favorite ones is called the YouTube comment snob, which just scans the comment page and anything with a swear word in it, it just removes it from the web page. Um, the result is you see a lot of YouTube, comment, or YouTube pages with absolutely no comments in them, but it's it's an overall more pleasant experience. Some of these things are also just really out there and wild. There's uh, one add-on called the Free Art Project, which replaces embedded ads on web pages with pieces of art from museum web uh, websites. Um, there's one which is really kind of esoteric. It's almost like a, a video game. You're, you'll be reading a web page, like a, an article on CNN, and in the middle of the web page is a line from a short story. Jim looked out the window and felt a feeling of longing. And if you click on it, it starts to replace more of the page that you were reading with this short story until eventually you've stopped reading about whatever news article you're reading about, and now you're, t you're finding out why Jim was forlorn. Um, and these are, these are experiments with the web experience. These are experiments with the way that you interact with this world of information. And they're not necessarily things we want to put in everybody's web experience. I think that would be a little strange, especially with the, the short story one. But they are important experiments to, to sort of allow happen. Um, and we're trying to do more of this. So Mozilla Labs is uh, something that we, we launched a couple years ago. And it keeps on growing. It's, it's great. It's, um, it's an inside-out lab. So instead of a, a building with a bunch of research scientists who sit there and come up with ideas, and then eventually we try to figure out how to turn them into products, the Labs is seven people. It's seven people who help incubate these ideas and help push them along and make them go faster. It's, it's a space for anybody who has a random strange idea about the web browser or web experience or the internet to sh talk about that idea and to find like-minded people to see if they can turn it into something real and tangible. And then we try to incubate the ideas that seem to have a lot of success. Um, a recent labs project is this thing called Ubiquity. And the idea of Ubiquity is taking mashups out of the hands of a web author and putting it in the hands of a web user. So instead of waiting for Google Maps to mash up an apartment listing page with a mapping page, you should be able to do that in your web browser. When you've got the address of an apartment, you should be able to just highlight it and say, map this, and then get a map. And then you should be able to say, and insert that map into my email, and it will do it. And you can download Ubiquity if you go to labs.mozilla.com. You can play around with it. But it's this idea of using natural language to sort of connect all of the various services of the internet and all the, the various data processing tools that are out there into a way that's, that's very personal and meaningful to you. So listen, lead, and play are the, are the three basic watchwords uh, of what we do to try to harness this chaotic design energy. And the interesting thing is that it ends up being really surprising in terms of how well it works and in terms of where the contributions come from. So the, the biggest, in my opinion, uh, user advancement that we shipped in Firefox 3 was the change to our location bar. Uh, which was called the smart location bar because we needed some sort of corporate name for it, but forget that, we call it the awesome bar. Um, and this is sort of a, a tracking the design progress of it. When it first started, the, the insight that we had was that renavigation, so going back to a web page you've been to before, is a very, very common activity in web browsers, and it's very, very poorly supported. You have to bookmark things, or you have to remember the exact URL. URLs aren't very human understandable. So we said, instead of just matching against the URL, why don't we also match against the page title? Because that's something which sticks in memory a little bit better. Um, like, for example, I remember the Onion article I read this morning called Obama Depressed and Despondent Since the Battlestar Galactica Finale. But I don't necessarily remember the exact URL on the Onion that it was. So I can type in Obama Depressed and Happy Day. 
as, as we put this into betas and, and uh, nightly milestones, what we found out was that people tended to go to certain pages more often than others, and they wanted those to be higher up in their result set. So we came up with this algorithm, which I named Freecency, uh, which everybody hates, but now appears in Wikipedia, so it's a real word. Um, and Freecency is a combination of frequency of visit plus recency of visit. And the idea behind this is that we wanted it to be magic. We wanted it to be that, uh, and not just us, uh, but people using our product expressed a desire to see the most relevant result first, however the heck we needed to do that. And then once we started talking about making the results more relevant, this guy named Edward Lee came out of the woodwork and said, well, why don't we also make it learn adaptively? We can do that. That's just programming. It's just code. We can figure out how to make it better. But by talking about what the user experience that we wanted to actually get to was, and by making it clear who these people needed to talk to and how we could get these things into the product, we were able to harness all of these, uh, these contributions. And the result is this really quite magical user experience where I know now that if I want to see treadmill kittens, all I need to type into my browser is YouTube kittens. And it's the first result. And I can watch kittens running on a treadmill, which is massively entertaining. Um, and so this, this, is, this is how it all works and how it all comes together. And as, as John alluded to earlier, it's, it's not the same as the way other companies do design. And it's, it's a, an easy way to think of it. A good caricature is this idea of a very chaotic design model where we let discussions happen. We, we let design sort of rise out of the system of talking about what it is that we're trying to do for users and how it is that we can do those things. Uh, and and that's, that's sort of how we do what we do. I thought we'd finish by you want to yeah. I thought we'd finish by talking about some about, but maybe the four big issues that we're thinking a lot about now. Um, we, there's a lot of things to think about in any big system like this, um, but there's a few that, that we're thinking about more more than others. So obviously the first one, you know, I, I asked about who's using Safari, who's using Chrome. Like that's sort of a new state of affairs that I could ask for about fi five different browsers, six different browsers, and and people are using all of them. It, that didn't used to be the case, and you know, five years ago it was IE, and that was kind of it. And that was a bad situation for all the reasons that monocultures are always bad, are often bad. But now we have tons more, uh, tons more browsers. And I guess I left Opera off, and they're circular, and I should let them on too. But this is a really great thing. There's more innovation in browsers than, than ever, in, in, in my experience. And I think, I think actually ever in the industry. And that's resulting in lots more good things happening for consumers. And so we think a lot about where browsers are going now. The first thing that's happening is that the performance is getting very, very fast. JavaScript, with all the um, just-in-time compiler technology that we have and Apple has and Google has uh, and, and Opera has, um, what we're seeing is that JavaScript can, can come within spitting distance of an op unoptimized C code. So it's something like 40, 50 percent, same order of magnitude. And that's a really big deal because it means you can run real, sophisticated, complex applications in the browser. The second thing, which is obvious, is that you know you're running more applications all the time. You're running more persistence. Like I run, I run a huge percentage of my life on the web these days. I, uh, it doesn't matter so much to me what applications I use, but it really matters to me that I have a good, fast, modern web browser and net access. And obviously, mobile is, is mattering a lot. This is a picture of our of our mobile uh, inter interface. It's, it's called Fennec. Fennec is a it's an Egyptian type of fox. It's very big ears. Um, it'll be called Firefox eventually because it's going to have all the same characteristics that Firefox has, and extensib extensible and, and changeable and fast. So that's coming now. Um, so we think a lot about what's happening in browsers. The second thing we think a lot about is language. So I mentioned we, we ship, we're going to ship in 70 languages. Um, first, I just want to tell you a little story. So when Firefox 1 was shipping, I guess, let me back up a second. So localization teams are teams all around the world who woke up one morning and said, I want to make Firefox in my language. And I want to find other people who want to do that too. Um, you know, our Mongolian localization, for example, was done by a guy named Naji, who was born in Ulaanbaatar, and he moved to northern Germany uh, for school. And, and he wanted a browser and an email client that his parents could use. His parents only spoke Mongolian, and so he learned how to localize Firefox and, and, and Thunderbird. And it was really when it was all sweet. So he's this, the localizer for Mongolian, and he makes it happen every time. And it's this amazing thing, because you don't, you don't get to be in the New York Times or on the front of news.com for being the Mongolian localizer of, of, a, of a software product. So it, it seems like a small thing, but for the 10,000 people who use the Mongolian version of Firefox and Thunderbird, it's everything. So he's meaningfully changed their lives 
just because he decided that was the way he wanted the world to be. And that, I think, is, that's, I think, is revolutionary and important and beautiful. The, um, the second story I'll tell is that when Firefox, in, so these localization groups or individuals or people, they just popped up all around the world. Poland has one of our strongest localizations, uh, localization teams. And actually, really, it's a very, very strong open source movement in Poland that has ties, uh, in many ways, back to the Solidarity movement. The solidarity movement. Um, but they were, they were in this period called string freeze for Firefox 1, which is the three or four or five days when you've got to figure out all the strings translate from English to your, to your local language, and how do you get them all, all in place. And what they realized is that uh, for Firefox 1, they did, there was no word in Polish for tabbed browsing. And so the, these guys, you know, often they're 20 years old or 22 years old, and they're in school, and they're like, oh, shit, like, what are we going to call this thing? And so they invented this word. They called karta, like card in, in Polish. And now that's the term for tab browsing in Poland. Because these, these, you know, these localizers brainstormed it over a weekend and put it in Firefox, and it became the language. Same thing happened in Danish in, in Denmark when <clears throat> for Firefox 1. They, the, the word that they created for tabs is um, the standard. It's the same word as a standard you use in war. Because it felt like a flag popping up at the top of the top of the browser to represent where where the thing was from, and now it's rep re recognized by the Danish government as the term for tabs in a browser. And so localization is this amazing and beautiful and fractal thing. Um, and now, as we start to think about things like natural language interfaces in in the mainline product as well, um, it's getting to be really hard. English is English is one thing, or Roman languages are another oh, one thing, but then you get Japanese, where the structure is different, and you have objects and subjects that are different, and so instead of left to right, well, right to left is a whole different thing, but instead of just being able to type a, a command, you might, you might have to put the object here and then have a verb that acts on the object or in a different way, and so you actually have structural interface differences that are really important to sort out, and no company is big enough to sort them out, so you have to ask for help. So we think a lot about language differences uh, around the world. Um, Beyond language issues, we think about cultural issues a lot. And it's what I'm going to show you now is the, um, this, is, this is Firefox China edition. So we opened a Chinese, uh, an office in Beijing um, a couple years ago. And the first thing that became clear is that uh, Chinese sensibilities about the browser were completely different than American sensibilities. And they just like, they're comfortable with a lot more of what, of what we consider noise. Um, so what, what this is, is it, you can see that it's just got, it's got more icons than standard Firefox does. This sidebar here is part of the interface in a way that I think mostly would be rejected by Western, by Western users. And, and we don't quite know what's going to happen. Is uh, the, uh, the internet, I feel like we're building this Tower of Babel in some, in, in some ways. The internet is the, sort of the new Tower of Babel. Um, and I can't tell whether we're going to converge or splinter. At any, on any given thing. I think there's some chance that as Chinese computer users become more and more savvy, they're savvy in different ways. It, it's lumpy savviness. They're savvy in different ways. But as we converge a little bit, it's possible that they'll start to decide they don't want advertising. They'll start to decide they don't want noise. It's also possible that Americans will just get more comfortable with it and will start to live in some sort of Blade Runner type future. It's, I think, really hard to predict um, what's going to happen. But we think about it a lot, and we're running this as an experiment to see. We actually just don't know. And the last thing we think about, we think about all the time. Is, yeah, scale. Um, so especially because of the sort of the structure that I talked about before, the open participatory structure where you get people advocating for change that they're interested in, that model was developed when our audience was uh, a million users. And 1% you know, of that was 10,000 people. And of those 10,000 people uh, who might represent 1% of the audience that was interested in one specific thing, maybe one or two would get really loud and noisy. 1% um, of our audience right now is 2.5 million users. And if you follow the 80-20 rule, where 80% you know, of the effort is done, you want the, uh, the interface to serve 80% uh, me, to serve 80 of your audience, because the last 20% is where you get into option hell and you, you start to lose focus, 20% of our audience is 50 million people. It's, it's a lot. And especially when you've got a system which is geared around listening, there's this question of, well, how can you now sort out what's actually meaningful to a large percentage of your audience versus actually a vanishingly small percentage of your audience? Where should we actually get our heads up about new ideas that are good and valuable and useful to a lot of people? And so this is, this is something we haven't really quite sorted out yet. And it's, uh, it's starting to become uh, really interesting um, 
because we want to identify these good ideas and these good contributors. And I, I, right now, our thinking is that uh, the best place and the, the best mechanism that we have set up for this are things like labs in the add-ons community, where things can prove their value through actually becoming real and tangible uh, and gaining huge audiences on their own. I think the truth is, though, we don't, we don't really know. Yeah. So in the, in the three years, four years that Mike and I have been at Mozilla or involved, you know, we've gone from you know, about 10 employees to about 220 employees. We've gone from um, you know, about 10 million users to about 250 million users. And in that time, the web has changed uh, almost, almost unrecognizably. Like we're, we're a little bit like the frog in the pot where the, where the water is warming up. You don't kind of notice it's getting warmer and warmer because the web is changing every day and we all, we, all, we all barely notice. But it's, it's really dramatically different. So on any given day, there's about 1,000 tweets about Firefox now. And w so now we're experimenting with way we can, one of our guys set up a feed so he can see the thousand tweets in a way he can quickly respond to, to tweeters about Firefox when they complain about, you know, performance or an add-on or whatever. And so he can triage about a thousand tweets uh, each day in an hour of his time. And that's a peculiarly strange leverage, but it's becoming commonplace and it's important. So uh, I think we're in a new space, like it's changing all the time. And the scope and the scale and the connectedness is changing really fast. And so, you know, I don't think there are any really good models um, except to listen and try and see what works and keep doing that and stop doing the stuff that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the only other thing I'd say is um, I'd encourage everybody here to, to join us in this experimentation. You're all part of the K-Org. You're all part of this chaotic system if you want to be. Uh, and what John was saying about revolution earlier is absolutely true. You've got the power to make Firefox better or to make the web better through some other mechanism that, that we can either help enable or just talk about. So uh, check us out. Yeah. So uh, any, should we end with questions? Any, any questions people have for us? No questions is fine, too. We'll stick around. Oh, sure, in the back. Uh, what kind of response are you getting from uh, uh, the websites that you, you are integrating with Ubiqu Ubiquity? It seems like you would be taking traffic from their sites, like Google Maps, for instance. If it would become seamless with the browser, there'd be like no need to go to the site and actually use it. Are you getting negative feedback? Nope. So I think there's a, the, the sensibility now around I think core web core web value and uh, is about how to, how you get to channels to people, how you get uh, exposure, how you convert new users. Um, you know, I think that any company now is trying to figure out, well, if I have this one web property, how do I get to the most possible, how do I get to scale? How do I get to, to be Twitter scale? How do I get to be Facebook scale? And that, and that when you get to scale of usage, that's when most of your economics start to happen. And so I, we find that people are less concerned about reduction of traffic in any one way, and they're more concerned about how do they get exposure and how, are they, how do they become useful? Um, so how do they get built into more mashups in any way possible? So, um, you know, We've got, I think, ubiquity command. There's maybe 2,000 ubiquity commands, things like Yelp and, and Twitter and FriendFeed. And so far, everybody's been really happy about it. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, what can we do about certain other browsers through their slowness in adopting certain standards end up stymieing web innovation? I'm worried about this. I'm worried. So, a couple things. So I'm proud of what we've done at, at Mozilla, and I'm, the 250 million is a big number and all this stuff. But like, it's we're still 75% of the people in the world use the browser that came with their computer. So for 8% of those, that's pretty good news because Safari is a pretty good browser. For 68% of the 67% uh, uh, now of people in the world who use IE because of what came with their computer, and I guarantee you they're not using IE because they think it's great. They're using IE because it's what came. Um, it's a really big problem because JavaScript now is about I mean, setting aside standards compliance for a minute, JavaScript performance is three to four times slower, at least, on IE uh, than every other modern browser. And so uh, I think that we really risk splitting the web platform now, that you have to build kind of a dumbed-down application for IE and a modern application for the other browsers. And that's a really uh, bad state of affairs. So um, the good news is Microsoft watches us. Uh, the good news is they don't like the direction the market share is going, and they know they're getting, they're getting their heads bashed in on this, really. Um, they are, I think Google Chrome really is making them pay attention because they dislike Google more than they dislike <laughs> us, um, which is saying a lot, actually. Um, uh, I don't know, what would you say? Uh, yeah, I'd say that, I mean, we've, 
I share the, the same worries that John has had. Uh, I think that when you take a look at how the web was, especially uh, 1997 to now, like 10 years, it's, it's no longer a monoculture. And it's getting to the point where all the new websites that are coming out are kind of, they're, they're building for modern web browsers first, and as John says, they're trying to figure out how they can make it work in older web browsers second. Um, as long as we continue the pace of innovation, I think it's going to drag any laggards along. And at a certain point, they won't be able to ignore it. Uh, and I, I think that our increasing market share and the increasing sort of passion and drive and development just on the web itself is the best lever that we've, we've still got. Yeah, I guess the other thing I'd say is that um, this is going to sound a little bit like corporate bragging or whatever, but it isn't really. Like when we were really worried when IE7 came out that uh, Firefox was trending up, up to the left. Um, <laughs> we were worried that when IE7 came out, we would stall or go down. And it turns out we got, fa like our adoption started speeding up when IE7 got released. Um, I8 got released and we just barely even noticed it. Like we weren't even really, like we weren't sure what day it was going to be and it just wasn't a big event for us. And I think that's because the, the market share is just collapsing for IE now. Um, I, I, I think you're going to, you're, you're seeing a bunch of support levels get really broken through now. So I, I think you're going to see IE at 50% within the next year down from 67% where it is now. And there's some, there's some natural support level that they'll be at 20 or 30% where people who just won't install software. Um, but I don't know whether that number is 15% or 10% or 30%, it, it's, but it's lower, a lot lower than it is now. So I think that's gonna change, change pretty fast. Um, yeah, we'll see, I don't know. They, they feel it though, and they know they have to do something. And IE8 is a better browser than IE7 was for sure in the damning with faint praise category. <laughs> Other questions? Sure. To mashing up. Why not mashing up browsers? I always have need two or three yeah. I'm forced to for various reasons. Yeah. I'd love to go get a smooth transition. Like for some websites like stand for business application and what IE. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't. Right. So can't you help me that just somehow I just yeah. Pick out the functionality I need from them, and the rest I can toss out. Yeah, I Not think. Not to speak of the inverse, I have a fight with the, the with Firefox. closing button. Yeah, the closing button. I love your protection story. Safari, they, as soon as you open the door, everybody else sneaks in. If you, I can make sure I only let in who I want to. Mm. I really have to edit basically the the cookies. Yeah, yeah. I hate that. Yeah. That, that's a bad design, basically. But, yeah, ultimately, I'd like to be able to pick and choose whatever works well, and eventually, yep. I'll probably focus on yours. Yeah. Well, so I think a few things. Uh, the first thing is that big, like, s browsers are still big software. Like, I think our code base is... Six million lines. Six million lines of code. And um, it's big and gnarly and hard to move around, no matter, no matter what. Um, there's some add-ons and things that will let you kind of approximate IE and Firefox and things like that. So there are some add-ons that will let you do that. But I think that's not really what you're asking. Um, the only thing I can offer, I think this is a hard problem. Like, it's the first thing. Um, I think the only thing I can really offer is that the good news is that, and this is a really big story, Google, so Safari is built on an open source renderer called WebKit. Um, Google is built on that same open source renderer. And Google, from the first day they launched Chrome, this giant company of tons of resources launched it in the open, in open source. And we talked to them. We talked to them about it a lot. We follow their blogs. They follow our blogs. And we steal absolutely shamelessly. Um, and in fact, I wish we could steal more than we, than we do. So, um, steal, borrow, that's fine. Uh, borrow is a much nicer word, and we'll do that. But we won't probably give it back, you know. But um, no, it's, um, it's uh, yes, we're trying to learn from each other and trying to be better at this. Standards are one, are one answer. Um, but I think your life's not going to be totally better on this for a while. Did you? Yeah, the, the only thing I'd mention is um, one of the experiments that's actually coming out of labs, and you're going to tell I'm a product guy because I've always got a product answer for things. Uh, but one of the experiments that's coming out of labs is this thing called Weave. And the idea of Weave is it takes your, your data and your state with you as you go, and, and you can transport it. And it's, there's actually a really fun story between um, Weave, Firefox, and Fennec, where um, you can be running Firefox, have five or six tabs open, and Firefox is connected to your Weave account, and so is Fennec. And then you walk away from your desktop, and you pull open your mobile phone, and your five or six tabs that were open on your desktop are instantly on your phone as well. So you've, you've got this seamless transition of your browser state and your online state follows you. And so 
those sort of technologies, again, are open and can be instrumented so that you could take your browser state with you about where you are on the web over to another browser client as well. Um, I, I think that the more that we standardize these sorts of behaviors in terms of web standards, it'll be easier for the, the browsers to communicate that way as well. Yeah. The cloud is part one of the answers, having yeah. state saved in the cloud. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Mike, you said uh, you choose a guy who provided smart idea as a radar, right? Yeah. How do you judge which idea is smart or how we is smart guy? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. So uh, there's a couple of easy ways to tell who smart people are. Smart people uh, generally aren't going to be instantly uh, reactive. They'll think about your comments. Um, and they'll be willing to work towards the solution uh, with people. Or at least smart people, as, as Mozilla defines smart people. Uh, you could be a very smart person and be extraordinarily hard to get along with, and you'll, you'll bounce off our community pretty quickly. Um, in terms of how you judge that an idea is smart versus not, uh, I think there's some data-driven approaches. There's also just some instinct-driven approaches. And there's a, there's a certain degree of trust that goes along with the product development community that is Mozilla. And you trust the people who have gotten us to where we are to be able to recognize smart ideas versus not smart ideas. Uh, in the case of the, the awesome bar, as soon as you used it, ad, anybody understood, you could just tell it was a better experience. And it was, it was basically not a question. So that was an easy one. There are harder choices to make. And, and sometimes we fail. But most of the time, I think we do OK. And actually, I think that one of the things we're trying to do to our project by basis is figure out how to fail more. So that sounds like a weird yeah. design thing. But um, without failure, you can't, you can't have breakthrough. And so in, in, in an open source, because you've got all these things in the open, you're doing it all, all in, in, in visibility all the time, you tend to be conservative, and you tend to try things that you know will work. Um, and so we're actually trying to figure out how to create more spaces for failure. Um, labs is, is one of those. Um, we've been criti like <laughs> internally, like labs are getting criticized for not failing enough lately. Yeah. It, it, it's one of those things. Okay. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a, a, a sort of a microscopic question and a macroscopic question. So the, the, the latter first, I, you know, when I hear this business model, I, I think, well, why couldn't the world, the whole world, uh, work like that? And um, what it seems like is that, that the 40% contribution is really the goodwill of other companies. Because, I mean, somebody is paying those people, people to buy groceries. And so, I, I mean, could you imagine everybody, like IBM, everybody being open source and sort of loaning each other well, people? Or? Well, so that's happening for sure. So the, the corporate infrastructure is happening a lot. Like, a lot of the reason why IBM, I think, will buy Sun is the open source code base and the community that they've developed around MySQL and some others. Um, I will tell you, I think it's not m necessarily economic and it's not necessarily companies helping other companies. People say, well, why, why would you, uh, my own view is that most people in the world, they just want what they do to make a difference. They want what they do to make the, their street better or their family better or their, their lives better or they want to be on their one of their face on the on the paper or t-shirt they want to get a t-shirt or whatever i think that most any organization can allow those interfaces for interaction and that's a very very that's a very very important way to think i think you're starting to see yeah i think it's happening all over i think yeah. it's happening with corporations i think it's happening with consumer companies i think it's happening with just neighborhoods and people you know the obama campaign here has much in common with uh, the open source movement and the farfas community they learn some things by watching us. We're learning things by watching them. Um, I think it's happening a lot of places. So do you have any idea when these, when these people, these 40% of people are working on, these, on, on Mozilla stuff? Is, is it during company time, or is it all so weekend stuff? I can give you a couple examples. I mean, uh, I can give you, I'll give you three examples. So there's me. When I started, I was working at IBM. And when I was waiting for other things to happen at IBM, or I was bored at work, when you know, when everybody at work would otherwise surf Slashdot, I'd surf Bugzilla, and I'd try to throw in some contributions then, because I wanted to participate, like John was saying. Um, we have this really important uh, process point, which is when we find a failure in our product, we need to understand when it started failing. If it's a failure where we've regressed functionality, it's called finding a regression range. And the reason why that's important is that 
we keep track of what we've changed at every step of the way. And so if you want to narrow down how to fix something, you figure out what you changed between point A and point B, and then you find the fix in there. Um, a great number of our regression ranges are found by a Danish housewife um, who just loves Firefox, and this is her way of contributing. And so she spends three or four hours a day opening bugs, and then she like has a bazillion copies of Firefox on her computer at home, and she just tries you know, one versus another, does a binary sort, narrows down a regression range, and puts it in the bug. This is incredibly valuable to us. This is something that you know, otherwise companies employ people to do, and you know, she does it because she enjoys it and has fun. Um, and then the third example is uh, people who, when you take a computer science class, a lot of the time your assignments are very not real. They're not actually fixing something that's going to fix a problem with not your Not here. At Stanford, they're all totally Are they all real? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> well, I went to school. They were, you know, I made a fake operating system. I did this, that, or the other thing. But what I didn't get to do is actually change a product that a quarter of a billion people use for the better. And so I think there's a lot of people who do it because they can. For them, it's like going out back and building a shed, which is really easy for, you know, my dad, but I have no idea how to do it. But I do know how to fix a string in Firefox when the punctuation's wrong. And so I can do that. This does talk, cause some people to have good days and bad days. Yeah. We, had, we had an intern last summer who worked on the <laughs> download manager, and his first check-in uh, turned out to be not very good. <laughs> and so we, Firefox builds every night, and then it gets distributed to th thousands of people. And so the, the day after he checked in his first set of code, he got, his mailbox was full of people calling him an idiot. So but things have gotten much better since then, and now he's a full-time employee. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, sometimes good times like that. So the What's yes. That? Yes, and if you want to join it, you can. We do have a QA team. We also have external people. Yeah. So the micro question, micro story, is, is just about your your free uh, free quit, not re uh, free, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, it it seems problematic that every time you type something in, something different happens. I mean, is that not your experience? Because the recency will change, mm -hmm. and so. I, I can't really get used to typing the following three things, and then I will get to my website. Uh, muscle memory is really disabled. And I mean, aren't you finding that? Uh, we certainly found that in early milestones. Uh, things jumped around a lot. There was no predictability. And that was where really the open process helped us, because we, we were able to figure out when it was getting better and when we were weighting things the right way, when the adaptive learning really helped, by listening to people using it, complaining, Complaining less, complaining less, magic. And once we got everybody saying magic, we knew we were done. Some people don't like it. Some people turn it off, but not me. I, like, I find that my muscle memory is fine. Yep. It's predictable enough. Other questions? There was one back there. Uh, yeah, so yeah, natural language technologies look really interesting. Um, and I imagine that's something that's really easy to get wrong. A lot of people haven't had much success in the past. Do you do any of that in-house, or do you mostly rely on uh, specific language? Um, we do. Uh, the, the, um, we, we brought a team in called Humanized. It was a, a, a three, three founders of a company um, and led by the son of the guy who, one of the original Mac, Macintosh inventors, a guy named Jeff Raskin. So his son, Aza, and Atul, and Jono came. And they've been thinking about natural language interfaces for a long time. So they, they spent a fair amount of their time speak, doing this. They, they all speak Japanese, and so Japanese is our first test case, and it's also sufficiently non, non-Roman that it helps. Um, but we just brought in a linguist, so we've, we've, we've got a, a contract with a linguist who speaks about half a dozen languages. Um, but because of the nature of our, of our localization community, we, we get all this stuff no matter what. So if somebody posts about the ubiquity parser is going to be noun, verb, object, um, we'll, we will the next day get, get a message from you know, Irina in, in Romania that says this is total bullshit, it doesn't work at all for Romanian. And, um, and that kind of happens by nature, by, kind of naturally for us. So we do have some people on payroll. We do have some outside contractors now. And we have a lot of people who are looking at it in their language. And that's how I want them to feel. I want them to feel empowered to say, look, this doesn't make sense in, in my context. And, and then they need to help us understand this. Sometimes it's hard for us to interpret. It, it's um, for lots of different reasons, cultural and language. But um, yeah, all, all over the map. And if you're interested, you should come. You, you met much to do. Yeah. So you're welcome to help. Other questions? All right. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thanks so much.
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.